My name's Nick Sloan. I'm a letter cutter, which means that I cut letters in stone, which can be for all sorts of things, from tombstones to lumps of art. It, uh, yeah, le letter cutter is all to do with stone. I mean, well, yes, I could cut letters in wood, but I choose not to, because I know people who do it much better than I do. Um, so as far as the letter cutting is concerned, it's all stone stuff. Well, no, that's not strictly true either. No, it is true. No, it is true. Letter cutter is somebody who cuts letters in stone or wood. But I do lettering in other media as well. Like I just had a job in cast iron and um, I do a fair bit of graphic design. But I think you're interested in the letter cutting aspect of things. So I guess we limit it to that. Yeah. And it's, um, how did you get into that? I... I was always interested in lettering, even when I was at school. I don't quite know where it came from, but I remember being fascinated by looking at painted lettering on shop fronts, and then I got interested in printing type. And, um, and when I was at school, it was the era of Letraset, and you could go to shops and get these fat, free Letraset catalogues, and I devoured them. Um, I was just, I don't know, it, it sort of clicked with something in me and I was fascinated with the different forms of letters. It was turning the page and seeing an alphabet which was completely different from the previous alphabet and another one, it was like looking in a sweet shop window. And all the more so because the actual stuff itself was far too expensive for me to buy. I hardly knew anybody who did buy it, but we loved the catalogues. And um, then, so the lettering bug was well entrenched and then I, um, I went to an exhibition in the V&A called the Craftsman's Art. Um, I'd been doing a degree in art history, which was interesting, but pretty irrelevant as far as I was concerned. And um, it was going to that exhibition that made me realise that there were people around the country sort of doing the stuff that I liked and making a living out of it. And um, I also read Eric Gill's autobiography, which is the classic inspiring text for letter cutters. And uh, I went around badgering people whose work I liked, starting with Reynolds Stone. And he put me onto Michael Harvey, and he put me onto someone else, who put me onto somebody else. And um, I found somebody in Norfolk who was happy to take me on as an apprentice. So that's where it started. Cool. Have, you, have you always lived in Somerset then? Or? No, I was born in Dorset. And um, then I was learnt the trade in Norfolk and came to Somerset in 78 because I heard about a wonderful derelict mill and I was looking for a cottage and um, ended up in a four-storey mill. Is and that where we are now? No, no that's not where we are now. We're in a farm now. Yeah. No, um, I got married and didn't have a garden and my wife's a king gardener and so that era of my life came to an end and now I'm here. But still, I like Somerset. I, um, I felt more at home in Somerset than I ever did in Dorset. I think because although I miss the land in Dorset, I like the people in Somerset better. Mm. I hope no, this is not going to be seen by anybody from Dorset. <laughs> you say, well, it's more of a compliment <laughs> to Somerset people, hopefully, right? Yeah, that's right. Good riddance yeah. to the Dorset lot. It's, um, so that, that's quite interesting that it was kind of like through a series of people that you met and kind of uh, the... I mean, is there a kind of personality that you find as a trait um, amongst letter cutters and people who are really into creating letters? Not really. No, I mean, there's a lot of common bond in that we're all slightly obsessed with letters. And um, being bonded by a common obsession is, is always a good thing. Um, but no, letter cutters vary. I think, I think on the whole they're, they're good types, like crane drivers and quarry operators, quarrymen. Quarrymen are good sorts. But, um, yeah, there's something about stone, probably, that keeps your feet on the ground and um, is good for the soul, yeah. Yeah, and it's, um, and so just that, could you talk a little bit about what it is that it, you, uh, you obsess over, let or makes you obsess over letters? Not really, I don't think. <laughs> it's just... Undescribable. Um, I don't know, it's, it must seem very strange to somebody who isn't obsessed with letters that you can spend your entire life just redesigning 26 symbols. But once you get into it, it's just, it's just endlessly fascinating. It's something about the way that 
and it, this goes right back to the letter set catalog days it's something about the way different letters have a give off different flavors and how do i explain it um the guy who taught me letter cutting a guy called david holgate very good letter cutter his letters always seem garlic flavored to me they, there's something about them i can always recognize a one of david's inscriptions they've got this sort of really pungent look to them and there are other people whose letters are always sweet and other people whose letters are quite salty and it's it's a difficult thing to explain but i just see them in that way they just just have a sort of character and a feel which sometimes but not always translates into into flavors but uh, yeah it's just there's nothing I like more than having a job where I've got to design a new alphabet for it and somebody says well yeah that's you know we don't quite want a Roman we don't quite want an italic and it's got to have this sort of feel that that's that's a real good thing to get my teeth into it, it's the drawing of the letters that's the real engine of my interest in it I have arguments with other letter cutters about this because I describe the actual cutting of the letters as um, once you've done the drawing as skilled donkey work and there are letter cutters who take grave exception to that and think that you know it's all in the chisel and you shouldn't be too punctilious in your drawing because the magic is in your hands well I think there is a magic in your hands I think that if you draw if you draw an inscription out very very carefully and cut it by hand you'll get a completely different result from if you draw it out carefully and get it cut by a machine because although the machine can do pretty much what I'm doing it doesn't do any interpretation and I do a sort of unconscious interpretation it's that th that strange paradox with craft where you're always aiming for perfection but it's the degree by which you fall short from perfection that gives it its character because you're never quite perfect and you never deliberate well sometimes you deliberately do things that are not perfect but you um it's the unconscious things the little irregularities that creep in when it's pretty damn perfect but not quite that somehow gives it its magic yeah and so would you call what you do um a trade or an art i wouldn't well I think we're sort of in danger of wandering into fallow ground here. The, I think, um, I wouldn't call myself an artist, I'll tell you that. Um, no, I call, and I wouldn't call myself a craftsman, only because I don't like the word very much. I don't know what I call myself. I'd just try to do a good job. So quality is uh, important in everything you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything I do, I try and do it as well as I can. Yeah. And, um, and it's never quite as well as I would like to do it. Do you, Which, do you feel it, because um, you're working in stone, that there's, because uh, you said that's kind of the only medium you're working in, really, that it's, uh, there's, there's kind of something long lasting about it, which means that there's more of an importance for perfectionism to shine through. I don't know, not really. I think I would be just as perfectionist with. Um, transient things um, I like to think that it will last and it's a bit depressing to see stones I made sort of 20 30 even years ago um, which haven't weathered well but um, no longevity is not not a primary thing really although slate is very nice for that reason because slate lasts beautifully if it's looked after if it's good slate in the first place and so you talked about um, you do a whole mixture of things. It's uh, w w what kind of varying uh, works you do? You said art and gravestones and the stone, the uh, stone work. Um, it used to be mostly art because I did a lot of work for a guy called Ian Hamilton Finlay, who's a poet in Scotland, who had things made in stone. He's, he did a wide range of different stuff and he got a wide range of different people to make it for him but he was very careful to choose good people to work with and he was he was a he was a great guy as a as a client because um 
he gave you lots of rope and um, paid well on time. Um, so yeah, Art, Art, when he died, was it four, four years ago or so now, um, that fell off slightly, but there are still people I do work for in the arty line. Um, some very good friends among them. Um, and I probably make slightly more gravestones now than I used to. And I do architectural bits and pieces and odd jobs people come along with. You're never quite sure what the next thing's going to be. And I like doing a lot of different stuff. I like doing some gravestones at least because it's part of a, a long and noble tradition and people take gravestones seriously. And it's nice to put things in churchyards and know that they're going to stay there for centuries, you hope. Yeah, and also you were talking about um, kind of like the the auteur theory coming through in people. The what like theory? The auteur theory be kind of the concept of uh, one person's um, work is uh, you can kind of identify their work. Oh like right, yeah. Someone's got garlic flake, like yeah, you yeah. Spot their mm -hmm. work. Would you say that yours has a, a particular, or do you have to be kind of variable based on who the client is? I don't know. I think it may be a bit like a bit like actors. Some actors are always playing themselves, and other actors are chameleons. I suspect that I'm a bit of a chameleon where letter cutting is concerned. Although I'd like to think that I had a had my own voice, but I don't. I, you can never tell with yourself, really. I do remember once being terribly flattered because um, a very good letter cutter and type designer called Michael Harvey came to visit me in my mill in Somerset, and um, he said, "Oh, I can always recognise your letters because the S's are so distinctive." And I thought, "Oh, that's nice." And he said, "Yeah, they're always too high on the crossbar." <laughs> <laughs> and um, I thought, yeah, you're quite right, they are. And then every, every now and then there are things that you sort of fall into the trap of normalising in your own mind, and then you suddenly see them through other people's eyes, and you're like, oh, God, yeah, that's a bit weird. There are certain people who always put too much space around their O's and other things like that. So, um, I'm yeah, up it's... your O now. <laughs> just check, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good to um, have people applying an incisive eye to your work from time to time. Yeah, and uh, are there certain letters that you kind of look at on a when you get given what's going to be written on a gravestone mm. and think, oh, there's lots of S's or P's or O's? Or I'd be quite pleased with lots of S's. I would not be so pleased with lots of O's. O's I find particularly difficult, I think. A lot of people struggle with O's, and it's to do with, um, it's to do with irregularities in the eye. And there's something I've never been able to understand about O's which is my O's are always slightly asymmetrical. They're always flatter on one side than on the other because when I look at them, they look completely normal. If I turn them upside down, they're sort of exaggerated in the other way. And um, the thing that I don't understand about it is that my, understa my understanding of how the brain and the eye work are that you tend to normalise to the things that you see a lot. And we see so many perfect circles these days in sort of car wheels and you know, you name it. Every circle we see is virtually a perfect circle because it's a mechanically made circle. Why does my brain not normalise and know what a perfect circle is? Why does it always try to make an asymmetrical circle be a perfect circle? Do you know, Josh? You're asking me. It's, um, um, I guess you get. What's the um, the uh, the term for people who um, detect personality through handwriting? Oh, graphologists, is yeah, it? Yeah, probably graphologists. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's some kind of, uh, there's some Freudian analysis to go on there. Some well, deep character like, defect, yeah. you think, is shining through here, yeah. yeah. Probably right. Maybe. I guess it's also the, the handmade appeal of, because um, you were talking about the fact that uh, machines can do a similar job, but it's different. It's different, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's a more appropriate job. But... Um, yeah, sometimes. I mean, I do, I do design for machines sometimes, machine cutting. There's the occasional job where either because of the scale of it or because of the nature of it, it's more appropriate to have it machine cut. And I do a little bit of sandblasting too, and I quite like doing that. Um, but I design differently for it. I guess that's all there. Yes, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope he doesn't come back next year, to be honest. <laughs> It must be quite distracting when you're trying to aim for perfection in your work and you have the bird flying through your studio. They don't do it that often. If I'm here and listening to the radio and tapping away, they find other things to do. Yeah. And so just um, 
just to get an idea in terms of like living in Somerset and being a freelancer what's kind of like a typical day for you do you have to work quite long hours to get the work done or it depends on the pressure of deadlines really I'm sort of naturally quite lazy I think but if there's a <laughs> job to be done I'll work very long hours I like I like working regular hours and I like I like the actual letter cutting the, the the days I hate are the days when I've got to do six different things and I have to make transitions from one to the other and it's very inefficient if I've got a long job on and I've come into the workshop after breakfast or nine o'clock or something and I turn on the radio and start tapping away the hours drop by it's quite tiring but it's sort of I, I can do it's probably seven hours solid letter cutting is a pretty grueling day um, yeah I'd probably average about six I should think but that's sort of actual on the job working no, I, if I need to work long, I will. Yeah. If I don't, I'll do other things. And you, you must have quite strong hands in from chiseling all day, is that? They're not getting any stronger. No, I don't think I do, actually. I don't, I don't think I'm particularly good at it, to be honest. Oh. <laughs> I, think, I think, well, I think my skill, such as it is, is in drawing more than in cutting. I can cut a decent letter. Um, and maybe this is just a sort of habit of thought. Maybe everybody feels this way, but I always... There's always a sort of uncertainty about it. And actually, my hands are a bit funny at the moment. That thumb has been weird for, for a few months. And I don't know why. I'm watching it. But no, I haven't got particularly strong well, let's hands. Let's talk about eyesight as well in terms of... Like, uh, <laughs> yes, How eyesight. does that work? So obviously you're concentrating on you know, definitions of lines for long periods of time. Yes, you, you really need to focus exactly. You need to know exactly what's going on at your chisel tip. And you can't afford to be at all fuzzy and my eyes are not brilliant i mean i used to cut without glasses until till i was about 40 just before late 30s I, my eyes just suddenly went like that and i had to start wearing glasses and now i tend to wear two pairs of glasses because i discovered a few years ago that if your glasses aren't quite strong enough you can just put another pair and they'll get the cumulative effect so i wear two pairs of quite strong glasses and that my depth of field is small but where I've got it, I can see exactly what's happening, so it works quite well. I anticipate having to wear three quite soon. Yeah. Which does get a bit messy. Yeah, and just as my final question, um, in terms of the future of all of this, and- uh, All of what? Well, your, 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 the work you're the doing. The deterioration of my eyesight. Well, no, 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 I wasn't meaning that, but more kind of, I mean, like, as you, someone took you on as apprentice, is that kind of your yeah. plan? Well, I'd love to say yes, but I think I'm honestly not cut out for teaching one-to-one. -one. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a loner. I find it quite difficult to concentrate when there are other people around me. And um, I've always sort of made a pact with myself that instead of taking on Apprentice, I'll write a book. Because I'm quite good at learning from books. And the, so for the people like me who are... I mean, I, I got on very well with David and he was terrific for me. Um, but I've also learned a lot of things through life by reading books and making my own mistakes and gradually getting there and um, I think that's going to be my payback not apprenticeships sadly not a handwritten book not a handwritten <laughs> book no but a, but a very carefully designed book